Welcome to Terrible Lizards, a podcast about dinosaurs with Dr. David Home and Izzy Lawrence. On this week's episode, how social were dinosaurs? And George Frab wants to know which ones could have turned into us. Hello, welcome. I am Izzy Lawrence, and opposite me through the internet, we have Dr. Dave Home. Hello. Oh, for goodness sake, sound, sound. Do, exa- do all right. Do you want me to do me brummy? <laughs> No, we're not doing accents. I can't bear it. <laughs> I can't bear it. She just I can't bear that. it. Because, you know, I have to socialise with you, Dave, to see what I'm doing here. I have to socialise with you and I can't be seen with you. We'd have to join a different group because <laughs> humans are the most social of all of the uh, great apes, certainly. We have the largest group packs, etc. We are a team, Dave. We can do this. Could a pair of dinosaurs have communicated and been a bonding team like us? Well, like us, almost certainly not. In general, probably. That's something that I've written about a lot and talked about a lot and am working on a review about a lot. Um, Just the degree of sociality, for want of a better word, in dinosaurs. Um, And this is an area that I think both the scientific literature and the public perception of it is really quite horribly skewed in some ways, which I think doesn't necessarily help being able to discuss discuss it effectively and so happily i have a platform where i can talk about it no one can interrupt or write a response paper because it's i can interrupt i can interrupt i have the power (laughs) (laughs) well Um, this is how do we want to approach this do we want to approach this looking at the mistakes that people make in talking about them about the dinosaurs or do we want to approach of these what modern animals do and how do they apply to dinosaurs well which way around do you want to do this podcast dave but both 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 and neither and together and some of it it, it, it's (laughs) it's it's i mean it's it's all relevant because it's it is a complicated picture that is of course then broken up by the fossil record but the the probably the first thing to do is just talk about actually defining things and defining terms which can get a bit um pedantic of course what would science be without pedantry um i love to wind up pedantic people one because it's easy and three (laughs) i think people have either used different terms interchangeably or used terms without defining them and then kind of meaning very different things with that um and so social itself just kind of I, i sorry social itself as a word when you talk about it in the context of animal behavior uh, often is used to mean some really quite close knit and complicated relationships not necessarily as you know as derived and and complicated as humans but you would think of things like chimpanzees and parrots and meerkats and other things like this as naked being naked mole rats naked mole rats uh, uh, those are you social but that's a different thing um but they you know they living together in groups there are often hierarchies there are often some complicated interactions badges Sorry. Yes, there, there are often... Well, no, badgers I wouldn't say, Oh, necessarily. really? Even though they live in sets together. Oh, interesting. But this is where we're heading. Mm. Degrees of interactions and often things like reciprocity. So, you know, you, ha- you have, like, friends within those groups. They will do each other favours in a way that they won't necessarily for others. I personally would say that those kinds of things are characteristics of things that are social. I would then say you have lots of things that are gregarious. They hang around in groups and may even live together in groups groups but without necessarily going through those things or even liking each other like my cats well yes things like buffalo and a lot of antelope and zebra and things like this flocks of starlings um they are hanging around together they are in a group they would prefer to be in that group to being on their own but there's not necessarily any kind of hierarchy there's not necessarily any kind of complicated relationships or complicated breeding cycles or cooperative behavior or anything like this they're just kind of hanging around because it's safer or more efficient for finding food or yada 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 there's only a certain number of cliffs that people can find to sort of like lay their eggs on uh yeah so that, that will force them together and and think you've got things like wildebeest is the one i love using so a 
everyone in the world has seen the classic, because there's about 900 of them, documentary of the Masai Mara Serengeti ecosystem. And here's all the wildebeest. And they all come together and they all march over the horizon in a big line when they're migrating from one bit to the other. The wildebeest in South Africa don't do that. They're non-migratory. Um, and even the ones in Masai Mara Serengeti that do do that, it's just to get from one place to the other. So it's like being stuck on the M6 isn't exactly a party. Well, right. And you can imagine quite easy, you know, and every time they cross the river, there's all, you know, they get drowned and they can't climb up the bank and then the crocodiles start eating them. Um, I imagine if if you dried that river up and then looked into it, you would find the bones of thousands or even tens of thousands of wildebeest together. And we have bone beds like that for various dinosaurs, in particular some of the Ceratopsians uh, and, and Centrosaurus, in particular among them. And one of the arguments that's been put forward is they're a social animal. Look, we've just found 10,000 of them together. And I would go, look at the Masai Mara. There are 10,000 dead wildebeest at the bottom of that river as part of a mass migration every year of a million. But they don't live together in a group of 10,000 animals. They just don't. They live in little groups of five to 10. And even then, they're not that social. It's usually just a harem, i.e. it's the females who are hanging around for protection and the male is keeping other males away. And then because they have to migrate, they all go to the same place at the same time. So of course, they all end up together. And those are not social animals and they are not living in a giant group. And so you've got to be very careful about, I think people need to be more careful about what terms you use, what you mean by them and how you're using that evidence to justify that interpretation. Because it could uh, not be, it's, it might not be a party, it might just be a bottleneck. Well, pretty much. Um, you know, crocodiles, there's a good example. You know, you will regularly see big groups of crocodiles together. They are hanging around in a group. But there's no social interaction going. Oh, yeah, the, the, you know, there might be the biggest, gnarliest dominant male, but it's not like he's in charge. He merely gets to do whatever the hell he wants by beating up the others. Um, so, yeah, you, you, there's, you know, the difference between social and gregarious is, I mean, it's it's shades of grey, of course, but the uh, from the two extremes, they're really quite different. And, of course, animals are really, really flexible. Um, everyone thinks of lions as living in groups. Well, they mostly do, but you do get solitary lions, not just lone males males but solitary females you get gangs of males living together occasionally cheetah are the one i love bringing up uh so mum gives birth to cheetahs and she she and her babies hang around and as they mature they will usually stay with mum quite late so you may have a group that look like they're all adults but it's actually mum and several babies the babies then usually go off and stay in a group for a bit brothers and sisters and then at some point the sisters will go off and become independent and live alone and the brothers will stay together together and live in a little pack or group of just brothers which may be joined by some other random males from elsewhere and then when females come into breeding season she will then hang around with the gang of males mm. so during their lifetime cheetahs go social solitary social solitary at different seasons they'll go social or solitary and that can often be determined on what sex they are and that's all just tied up in one species and so again you know we talked about tyrannosaurs in in an episode and like group of tyrannosaurs together and you find four tyrannosaurs in a quarry and someone goes holy hell they're social animals and I'm like whoa 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 and this is the problem <laughs> for that because I, I think those are the conclusions that people tend to leap to um, is that any kind of grouping together in the fossil record equals social and it certainly doesn't have to. I mean what interests me um, is the different types of social group there are because I think we come from a sort of mix of monkeys and and apes and everything else and our social groups are complicated even like macaques have quite a complex social structure where it matters who you're related to who you're friends with friends and with, there's yeah. literally cooperation in survival but then you've got things like rooks which all sort of live together and make a lot of noise by the railway station but they all seem to have their own nests and they don't seem to be much cooperation in helping each other out is there a biological distinction between the different types of social groups that you can get and herds and things you know i don't get that deep into it and as i say there's you know like, like we kind of mentioned about intelligence before now you know there's, there's shades and shades and shades because there, there's not clear definitive 
hard lines that separate X from Y, with, with a couple of exceptions, you know, things that are, you know, very antisocial, that basically live on their own almost to the exclusion of, you know, they'll only just about tolerate a member of the opposite sex when they're ready to mate, and that's about it, and the rest of the time they'll fight tooth and nail. That's friends fairly, like that. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's, that, it's fairly easy to separate them out from almost anything else. And at the other end, you've got, you know, what are called eusocial things, so things like mole rats, um, things like um, termites and ants and, and various kinds of bees and wasps, bees. who absolutely cannot function outside of these groups where they even have different castes that are, you know, literally built differently and have different morphologies and, and yada, yada, yada. Those two extremes are fairly well separated. And, and the rest is, I think, it's just a massive smear, a continuum from basically solitary to very highly social, complicated relationships. Um, and so you can obviously immediately see why that's going to be very hard to pull out from the fossil record. And then, as I say, it's very highly variable within species, depending on various circumstances, like the cheetah and like the wildebeest. Um, it's very highly variable between species. This is another problem. So again, talk about tyrannosaurs, because we, we had them recently. You know, you've got uh, Teratophanius and Albertosaurus and Tarbosaurus, and arguably a couple of others are found in at least pairs and certainly groups. And that's been inferred. All, all tyrannosaurs did that. Well, again, lions mostly live in groups, cheetahs mostly live in groups, but none of the other cats do. Um, most of the dog species live in groups, but a few of them are solitary or only live in pairs. So, you know, and then as I say, wildebeest, highly flexible. So you you can't make easy inferences about near relatives like that. And, and as I say, even within a single species, populations can be very different from each other. You've got this problem, I think, often of the data in the fossil record being overinterpreted and kind of overspread and kind of like, oh, well, we've got four or five different species where we've now got them in multiple groups. Ergo, this clade as a whole fundamentally lived in groups. And then often that becomes social. Can be horribly overstated. As a subdivision of that is then the pack hunting thing. Yeah, because this is the thing, because there is a different... I mean, hanging around in a herd is one thing, but then... And and I think most of us are quite used to the idea of um, particularly herbivorous animals coming together for certain reasons, like finding a mate, hanging yeah. around where the young's young, and the, uh, they can still be quite solitary. But when it comes to hunting, that implies teamwork, that implies communication of sorts and cooperation yeah. of sorts. It requires a hierarchy because you're sharing a kill. So yeah. when it comes up with tyrannosaurs, I think we all get quite excited because if there's one thing more terrifying than being hunted by one tyrannosaur... Well, it's by, by, by a dozen, By yeah. more than one, it would be, ah! Yeah, again, and, and Velociraptor and, you know, Deinonychus are the... Because are the, are the, the I think I could take novels. a Velociraptor, but two of not, them, Not four not. or five, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so again, we, we've got similar kinds of issues. So you, you can cooperate without necessarily being social. So there's some lovely stuff done on... Uh, Cayman in uh, would be in the Amazon or one of those one of those river systems down there um, where periodically you get these fish runs so fish are going you know from one bit of the river to the other bit of the river to breed or to 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 get to a different system and they'll they'll come on mass and what scientists have observed it's really quite cool is that the Cayman will basically get together and line up almost you know shoulder to shoulder slightly spaced out from each other yeah facing down the river I just want to underline for people who don't know Caymans are sort of crocodile type thing just to make sure because yes yeah it's, it's an unfamiliar word for some people just making sure fair enough yeah so, so we got basically got mostly not particularly big crocodiles so two mm. three meters long um and they'll, they'll line up yeah all, all facing down the river now they are cooperating um if you think about this in terms of like a well game theory though we don't really want to particularly want to get complicated into game theory but <laughs> they're basically doing better out of this than if they were on their own because if they all hang around separate from each other and he's got one case in its own bit of river the fish will just go round it and it will catch a few but it won't do very well but if everyone sits shoulder to shoulder every single fish will pretty much have to go past one and therefore everyone's going to get a chance at snapping
snapping at a few more fish than they would on their own. So they are cooperating, but it's not like there's some kind of cunning group think planning, setting an ambush and outflank. No, they're all hanging around anyway, trying to grab fish. And sooner or later, they either worked this out or chanced upon it and therefore learned from it or it be- and ultimately became instinct. Or what, it doesn't really matter. But it's- it, reminds, it reminds me a lot of um, the stories I hear about men at urinals in that they don't want to cause a fight by trying to sort of be too close to each other, but they'll automatically space out quite evenly in order that <laughs> there is a competition, as it were, and it doesn't get too close and awkward. So you want to, if you're a caiman, you want to go next to another caiman, but not too close to the they're going to snap at you. Yeah, pr- pretty, pretty much. And you, you, and, and and you also get these things of kind of like suppressed uh, competition when there is a glut of food. So you know, grizzly bears do not normally like each other. But you've seen photos of grizzlies with salmon runs, or there's some some stuff with some dead whales that have washed onto a beach, and there's like forty grizzly bears on it, and all the aggression is turned down because there is more food than any of them can possibly eat. So why fight? Um, and so you are, and again, that's another example that I've. It's like you can just imagine the big wave coming in and washing them all into a into a into a landslide. And twenty million years later, the future paleontologists go: grizzly bears lived in groups of forty hunting whales. And it's like, <laughs> but but honestly, that's what some of this feels like to me. It, it's, it's this over abstraction. So that's that's one side of the social hunting. The other side is you have think of hunting in a group. The other side of it you have is things like hyena, even the spotted hyena, which we always see in these you know group hunting and and pack hunting stuff they mostly hunt on their own so they do live in clans with complex hierarchies and stuff like this going on matriarchies yes but they mostly hunt alone now they do hunt in groups it's true but the idea that it's some kind of if you live in a social group you're a group hunter isn't really true we see a couple of other things so uh, ground hornbills the really lovely big black ones with the red heads that walk around in groups and 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 ruffle through the leaves they they're doing something actually not a million miles away from the caiman because if they just line up and they all walk through they will flush out birds and mammals and lizards and big insects and stuff it could also be like for crime detection if you train them they, they'd be able to find the murder weapon very useful for that definitely um, and so it's the same thing in that on average they're doing better than if they did that on their own because you may chase a lizard and miss it but if it goes left or right someone else is probably going to get it and vice versa so there's some level of cooperation there but it's not some big complicated system that that's going on um and you know meerkats are basically doing the same thing they you know they're living in very big groups and yet mostly they they all bugger off and each one tries to grab a grub or a you know or a scorpion scorpion. i've seen them eat scorpions and i've seen them eat snakes yeah well they find Um, snakes yeah, so so you've you've got things like this, and then you've got pears. So things like honey badgers are often living in pears. Oh. Things like uh, caracaras, which are these little South American hawks, live almost exclusively in pears. Now that often is very cooperative, but it's only two, and it's your mate, it's your partner. So that on the one hand, that's kind of very social. On the other hand, it's also not if there's only two. And so that's what we've got, both the general social system and then particularly the group hunting. And you can see all these caveats and exceptions and weird different ways of doing things. And so when you look at Deinonychus or you look at Albertosaurus and they go, right, there is some decent evidence of these hanging around in groups. I really don't think that's synonymous with pack hunting at all. And I think it would be very hard to prove it. And of course, with again with things like hyena, even if you did prove it, I, I can make a play of a truly extraordinary trackway where you can see an extended period of like a running herbivore with multiple different tracks of predators and dromaeosaurs have very distinctive two-toed tracks because they claws off the off the ground and you can see that at some point animal a steps over the track of animal b and later b steps over a so they must have been there at almost exactly the same time if they can cross each other and then they all converge or you see some tracks go around and come back in if you had something like that i'd go yeah that looks like a group cooperating to bring that animal down i will absolutely give you that but that doesn't mean that this is their normal behavior 
behavior and this is what they do all day every day and they're fundamentally pack hunters because well unless unless it's it an amazing te- strategy it wouldn't say that. unless unless it told such a story that suggested that you know they deliberately like that there's one that just stood there the entire time we do see lion set ambushes they are capable of complex social hunting we also see them just run off on their own and do whatever the hell they want it, it's not like it has to be and that's that's what i think people miss is that behavior is so plastic and variable individuals change their behavior all the time so talking about whole species or whole clusters of species i don't think people when they're saying oh tyrannosaurs hunted in groups meant that that they're incapable of hunting alone i think that's a different thing because i think the fact that they were capable of hunting in groups and did hunting groups suggest a certain level of intelligence and sociability within that group and hierarchy that's often not how the public take it. And again, even if you you had some of this evidence, it wouldn't necessarily mean that they were even particularly social. Um, again, things like the Cayman example. All of this is tied up together and therefore a bit of a mess in some ways as to quite what animals, quite what dinosaurs were or were not doing. The flip side of all of that, so I've, I've now just broken it down and said that everything that everyone says about social dinosaurs and pet hunting is absolute rubbish. Now, to turn it over and say the exact opposite, because this is the fun bit. This is this is just like an academic essay, Dave. Yay! <laughs> I'm not sure if that's supposed to be a compliment got, or not, but got, I'm, ta- well, I'm going to take it as well. <laughs> it's an educational podcast, and by God, I'm going to educate them. Well, I'm not. I'm just going to rant for a bit, and hopefully someone will listen. <laughs> it's the same thing, really. The flip side of that is that, yeah, for a lot of dinosaurs and whether species or whole clusters of them, we have really quite considerable evidence of them at the bare minimum hanging around in groups really quite a lot of the time. We have not just one bone bed, but multiple bone beds where lots and lots and lots of individuals are together. We see that repeating structure. So we'll see several different bone beds and they always have the same kind of patterns of distributions of juveniles and adults. Like only juveniles together or only adults together and things like this. Um, Loads and loads of trackways where you've got multiple different tracks, but they're all about the same size and they're all traveling in roughly the same direction. Are they all the same species, those trackways? It's hard to say, of course, with tracks, but you don't usually get too many obviously mixed herds of things. Um, So probably um, that's not a problem. Um, And when you put all of that together, therefore, there there is, you know, considerable evidence. So I think the, the ultimately what this all therefore boils down to is that I think a lot of the time any given single incidence or single fossil of something is on its own really quite weak evidence because there are always alternate possibilities and exceptions that could produce a different answer to, to that or, or or it's a chance association so there's one I've moaned about before there's a there's a there's a tyrannosaur track and it's oh, a group of tyrannosaurs well it's it's two which already is not really a group um and then the problems start kicking in of course because these are and they say oh well the track you know the, the the way the tracks are formed and the way that they've eroded they look like they were put down very similar times and it's like okay very similar is not identical so these animals could have been an hour apart. These kind of was, you know, if, if the weather's just right, these could have been 12 hours apart without the mud drying or getting more wet. So you don't know that they were definitely together. It could, even if they were together, it could have been a breeding pair or it's mating season. It could have been a young animal following an adult. It could have been um, a male trying to chase another male out of his territory. It could have been a male chasing a female because he thinks she's coming into season. All of these are plausible explanations. It could have been a complete coincidence and that's just the route to the water and it was dry that day and so two different animals happen to converge on the same water hole. All of these would explain why you had two or even three sets of tyrannosaur tracks moving in the same direction at about the same time. None of them would have anything to do with them living in groups, let alone hunting in groups. So any individual set like that, I think, be it trackway, be it bone bed, etc., is dodgy as hell to use as evidence. 
if you could see by the pressure of the tracks and how fast they were going, would that not suggest that they were chasing or running away from something together? Well, no, well, in this case, I think they're all, they they're all just, they're all other, just walking. Suppose. But again, you know, yeah. animals mostly don't run unless there's really good reason to. Um, you know, if you you know you think about something like tigers, you know, when a female comes into season, you know, males will be after her. You can expect two or three males to show up. So multiple males are going to be going in the same direction and heading towards the female and meeting that female and, and, and things like this. Or, you know, bears. The salmon run is starting. Bears from 100 miles around are going to, well, maybe not that far, but, you know, bears from good fair distance apart are all going to be converging on one spot. And at the end of it, they're all going to diverge again. You could easily get lots of trackways together. Um, so, yeah, it, on the one hand, single incidences, even several incidences of things like this, I think are really quite weak evidence for group living. On the other hand, you look at something like hadrosaurs. We have so many bone beds of hadrosaurs and multiple group nesting sites of hadrosaurs and so many sets of footprints of multiple hadrosaurs together. It would be very churlish for me to say, oh, well, there's no good evidence for social living in any dinosaur. Because no, I, I'm absolutely very, very happy with the idea that hadrosaurs, a lot of hadrosaurs are fundamentally hanging around in groups. It just becomes very hard to then pin that down onto a given species because you're drawing information together from lots and lots of different sources. And it still doesn't tell us, as I say, go back to something like the wildebeest example, it still doesn't really tell us quite what's normal or quite what we might be driving exceptional circumstances. You know, yeah, we've got lots and lots and lots of mass bone beds for, for hadrosaurs. Great. I'm sure some hadrosaurs lived alone. I'm sure some of those hadrosaurs that lived in big groups also lived alone. I've bet at least a couple of those. We've only got them in big groups in the fossil because there was a drought or they were migrating or something else drove it. And, and you know, but, but we won't necessarily be able to pull those apart or guess at that. And so I think that's the double-edged sword. I absolutely don't put people coming away thinking that dinosaurs weren't living in groups or that we don't have any evidence for it because we absolutely do. I am just very conscious of the fact that you will see a lot less in the scientific literature, but it's still some in there, but definitely in books and museums and documentaries and stuff. And it's, oh, well, this was a pack hunter or hadrosaurs lived in groups. You will see that as a statement and you're just like, they died in groups. And they walked around in groups occasionally. But it's just the way they're phrasing it, you know, really implies that, you know, like elephants, though again, male elephants mostly live on their own, um, but, you know, like elephants, you would not normally see hadrosaurs unless they were in a group. Because that's what I think people are often mean by that, or certainly it's what they often imply by that. And again, I, I have a real issue with that because I think a lot of hadrosaurs probably did live in group, but a lot of them didn't. And even the group living ones probably had ones that didn't or varied depending on the situation. And because, as I say, you know, any given incident, there are always potential alternate explanations. You've got to be very careful about going, that one did this and that one did that. Mm. I'm just trying to think, um, because you're sort of saying some hadrosaurs did this and some hadrosaurs did that. And I'm just, it made a question come up in my head about the actual diversity of life back in, say, the Cretaceous. Like, I mean, literally, the were there about the same number of species of everything? thing then as there is now do we think probably not mm. um for two reasons first of all on average over time diversity seems to go up okay, even yeah. even allowing for the vagaries of the fossil record um and the general in interpretation of this is um more niches to fill presumably well so, so it's it, it's certainly in terms of bigger lineages rather than necessarily species but if you can imagine you know we've got 10 lineages and they all diversify so you've now got a hundred lineages lineages and then you know three quarters of them die off so you're down to 25 but you've now got 25 rather than 10 and they can all diversify and so you even if you cut it down every time if only a couple of them survive and keep you know, like platypus platypus appear to have been around for about 100 million years there's still only one of them but that's a whole branch of evolutionary history is represented by just the platypus um and there's lots and lots of odd little lineages like that and so that that pushes your kind of net diversity up, at least in terms of big clades, not necessarily for individual species. Um, 
Uh, the other reason that diversity is probably lower in the Mesozoic, at least in terms of big animals, is that we think dinosaurs are filling multiple different niches simultaneously. Because they're small and get bigger. Because, right, because they're, they're doing this, yeah, you know, a 70-ton sauropod and a 7-kilogram hatchling are absolutely not doing the same thing. And if you if those were antelope, they'd be seven or eight different animals. You know, you have things like diker and dick dicks, which are, you know, two to five kilos all dick the way up to... Dick dicks are the cutest. I like them very I much. love dick dicks. Have you seen... There, there's a, there's there's a, a uh, there's Twitter, dick dick un, pics, unsolicited yeah. dick dick pics. <laughs> <Just, laughs> Great. Right. Um, yeah, but, you you know, you've got tiny little things like dick dicks and clip springers. You've got pretty small things like bushbuck and diker. Um, then you've got medium size. Well, I'm, I'm just thinking just yeah. within Africa, you know, just within, you know, a single ecosystem. Um, and then you've got kind of medium sized things like, um, you know, sable antelope and... And, and, and impala and then you've got big things like kudu and then you've got huge things like eland and they're all eking a living out but if you're a dinosaur you start at the size of one and you finish at the size of the other and you just grow through all of those different niches and so suddenly one dinosaur has done the job effectively of five or six mammals so yeah you probably haven't got as many so the reason i was asking this is it does make sense then that because the dinosaurs themselves are fulfilling all of these different niches with just one species anyway it could be that you know what we would consider two different species of say duck which look almost identical in the fossil record um two different species of hadrosaur which look almost identical fossilly but might have lived completely separate lives not really interbred very much in the time period that they were alive could be behaving in entirely different ways as well yeah well like, like i said you know you've got modern wildebeest where but that's the same species yeah it? right yeah. but that's <laughs> you, you pretty much couldn't tell them apart and yet one's a mass migration and the other isn't. So yeah, their behaviour can be dramatically different. See, what I like to imagine with hadrosaurs is they're all living quite close to a river and they were all dying and falling in the water and then they all like fell off a waterfall and all their bones were dead at the bottom of the waterfall. I'm saying that they could have... It looks like, you know, years later then you find all these dead hadrosaurs together, but that's just where they've collected rather than, you know, they didn't even need to die in the same spot if they have yeah, fallen into p- water. P- is what potentially. Um, so, so one last thing that's worth saying is so one important thing that we do see is we do quite often see differences between adults and juveniles. So the ornithomimids, so our ostrich mimic gallimimus like animals, there are now a number of groups of those known where there's half a dozen plus animals preserved together and they are all juveniles. And remember, juveniles in the fossil record in general for dinosaurs are really, really rare. And so we've got loads of juveniles together, but we only ever find adults on their own. Hmm. Now the juveniles, in particular, we've got mud trapped herds. So they're literally dr- drying mud and they've got stuck and they can't get out and they've all died. So there's a slight caveat there because you can imagine that adults may be able to escape that when juveniles can't. But it's still pretty suspicious that we have multiple groups of the juveniles and the adults, it hasn't happened yet. And that does suggest that juveniles are doing one thing and adults are doing something else. This is, again, really quite common. We see things like green iguana. They hang around in groups when they're young and then disperse and usually live on their own or certainly are not in such groups as adults because juveniles are fundamentally more vulnerable to predators. It's a good idea. Triceratops is actually a pretty good example of this. Although a lot of the specimens are fragmentary we've got dozens and dozens and dozens of specimens of triceratops we've got like three or four for juveniles several of which are in groups mm. so you basically now there is supposedly one triceratops adult group out there I've heard about I don't know if it's true but I've heard about it but again when you've got hun- like dozens if not 100 plus adults and every single one of them is solitary with possibly one exception and then three or four juveniles and they're mostly in groups that's really starting to lead you down down the line that juveniles hang around in groups and adults hang around on their own. And that's where it becomes more convincing as a case, particularly when juveniles are so rare. I mean, couldn't you also say that ceratops in particular is an animal which doesn't suggest that it hangs around in big herds just simply because so the, the way the horns are, the fact that they're so armoured against themselves rather than Well, against... but elef- elephants will occasionally fight to the death and they'll certainly beat the hell out of each other and yeah. they're very well equipped and yet they're very social animals. As I say, Centrosaurus, we've got bone beds of Centrosaurus with certainly hundreds and potentially tens 
tens of thousands of individuals in. It's That's a lot. It is, but but then again, you know, I go back to wildebeest and go, you can see, you can watch. I've I've been and I've seen this. There is a million wildebeest in a herd moving together. The right that smells so bad. Yeah, <laughs> you know, but the, but the the right, you know, one in a hundred thousand year storm mm. could easily end up trapping and killing a hundred thousand of them together. You know, mm. an absolute log jam up a hill and just as they come to the river it frees up and you know every single one of them is just washed away as the river bursts its banks and then of course the first big lake they hit all the energy goes from the system they all drop and hit the bottom at once they were all alive together in one place at one time is that how they spent their lives cool um i suggest um we go to our guest who um this week is the magnificent george Hrab of geologic podcast fame of multiple songs and sciencey nerdy goodness and here he is george what's your background do you do you like dinosaurs did you i mean come on are you aware of them as a thing how long has this been going on here's the thing it's 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 uh growing up in new jersey right across Ooh. the river from new york city where the museum of uh natural history is uh which has the iconic dinosaurs throughout it the skeletons though the uh the, the brontosaurus with the wrong head on it uh they had this like they had the wrong head on it for 60 years they had didn't realize they had to like crack the neck to make it fit right and the whole thing so growing up and going to that museum as a kid was the coolest thing you could possibly do especially in the 70s where uh when you went into new york the bus would pull up to the museum and we were instructed to run inside don't look at anybody don't talk to anybody outside <laughs> Just run to the museum. Once you're in the museum, then it was like this safe haven. We were fine. And then at the end of the day, we run back in the bus and drive back to New Jersey because that was before, you know, Disney took over Times Square. So, uh, so yeah, I have a, I have a very, I mean, I, I, I had my plastic dinosaurs as a child and stuff. And, and yeah, I'm not, I'm not uh, uh, super well versed, but, you know, I've seen Jurassic, the, the, fir- the first four Jurassic Park films. So, yeah, that's pretty they're, much. They're, they're, they're not going to make Dave twitch at all. None of that is accurate <laughs> to the point of accurate. Oh they yeah, oh, no, oh it's yeah, a, um, amazing, <laughs> amazingly so. So, do do you have a question you would like to ask Dave? I do. Go on. I then. do. Okay, so let's. This is now. This is my favorite kind of question because it involves speculation, and there's no answer. And those are my favorite kinds of questions, okay? <laughs> or a very, very long answer, or a very, very yeah, yeah, an answer that's going to take a whole other <laughs> series of shows, which we'll do at some future point. Okay, so and it involves some imagination and some fudging of stuff. But uh, let's let's imagine. Let's imagine 66 million years ago, uh, the big rock doesn't fly into Chicxulub. Okay, it doesn't smash mm. into the coast there in the Panamanian Panama or whatever it is. Um, and the subsequent uh, rise of mammals and all that stuff doesn't doesn't quite happen. If you had to put your money on which kind of dinosaur, and I know evolution doesn't work this way, but just play along. Yeah. Which kind of dinosaur would eventually be renting Bridgerton on Netflix? Who would you who would you go with? Which dinosaur is going to be the one that's booking flights on KLM 65 million years later? And, and is it because of hands or brain size or depth perception or or what? Who who would you put your money on? Is this is the this is the one? This, this is the one. This is the one that's going yeah, to have uh, you know car yeah, so car I'd, rentals. I'd, I'd love to give, I mean, it's a really cool question and it's the kind of thing where I'd love to give a really, like, independent answer. But this is the kind of thing which paleontologists get asked all the time. Oh, and really? Although, it's a classic bit of kind of what ifery and and kind of paleo nerdery and this has been discussed lots of times by various different people and so of course I, I can't avoid the fact that this has already been discussed to death and that most people come to more or less the same conclusion I think for the same general reasons which and that's Truodon or something very like it so Truodon's definitely come up on the podcast before but okay. in case people have missed it it's Truodon and its relatives they're kind of very small to mid-sized feathered dinosaurs they're one of the groups that's very 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 close indeed to birds. Uh, and one of the reasons they often get dropped into this conversation is they do have a larger brain per body size than almost any other dinosaur. And the fairly reasonable assumption is they're probably one of the most intelligent. Obviously, really knowing exactly is basically impossible, but a bigger brain is obviously a pretty good start. For watching um, Bridgerton? Well, it's, it's probably going to help, of course. <laughs> 
But isn't there some issue about Truodon? Like the, in the last couple of years, they were mis- mislabeled or something? Is that, or am I remembering that weird? Truodon specifically within the Truodons, it has been a long term problem because it was originally named off a bunch of teeth and then it was a lot longer until any bits of skeleton were found. And honestly, I can't remember its exact taxonomic status right now. I think there is now some bit of a skeleton that is formally assigned to Truodon. Okay. But there was lots of kind of taxonomic wranglings over for exactly which bit do or do not belong to this species because it, it's one of those examples where Truodon has really weird teeth. Okay. So they're, 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 they're curved like most of the predators are and they have little serrations on them like most of the predators are except for the Truodon it's got huge serrations on the backside and almost none on the front. And at the time that it was discovered this was totally unique and no one had ever seen anything like it and so it was a totally good idea to name a new species. And then you start finding loads of them everywhere and you go oh <laughs> there's a whole group of dinosaurs that have teeth like this. Right. Because they're probably not all the same one. Which ones are which? And then particularly because Trudon was the first named, it has a certain special affinity because you're supposed to compare everything to that and then it all gets complicated. But going back to answering your question, yeah, you've got an animal that's quite possibly omnivorous and relatively intelligent and does have long, relatively grasping hands. And so given that the only model we've got for hyperintelligence more or less is humans, those are some features that it shares with early hominids or certainly various derived apes. Any behavioral um, stuff though, in terms of like like pack behavior or... We don't know, but, but, but that's but that, that's something that is I find particularly annoying or egregious. So there's, there's this idea that kind of group living automatically brings with it intelligence mm. and there's I I think personally I have some disagreement with some colleagues about this at the moment I think that the, the kind of case for group living in a lot of dinosaurs is, is greatly overstated um, or at least th- there's evidence of things being in groups but then people automatically assume that means these highly social structures and complicated interrelationships it's like well we, we yeah I mean that. I mean look at American conservatives you know they live together well, there's <laughs> But but yes, there's no, no, intelligence, evidence, there, no intelligence. evidence of intelligence whatsoever. So yeah, it's a good point. Good point. <laughs> That's a reasonable guess. I mean, the the, the other thing, of course, is is to because we kind of have to mention it is that you've got both living parrots and crows, which are Clever. extraordinarily intelligent right. and more intelligent than all you know most mammals, and all probably more intelligent than almost all but a handful of primates. So at least two groups of dinosaurs have gone on to kind of higher primate, higher inverted commas primate levels of intelligence. So right. it's certainly something's going on. I have a question about um, plural nouns collective nouns what do you call uh, do uh, is it a flock of truodontids then or is that just birds what what do I, they call? I don't i don't think there is one um, <gasps> dave this could be yeah. your thing you could go through all of the dinosaurs and give them group names it's it's a sp- a, a Spielberg, a Spielberg of true. <laughs> <laughs> it it's, it's it's more or less the opposite. I've, I see on like Reddit and other forums, uh, kids getting into huge rows over whether dinosaurs should be male and female, or buck and doe, or cob and pen and stag, and, and all these other things. Oh, it's like, oh, yeah. but they should be flocks. No, no, because they, they should be herds. And it's like, well, there's there's no official terminology for any of this, and there's not an enormous point in creating. Creating one, um, you know, we have some informal things. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about chicks for for, for young juveniles, yeah. particularly if oh. we know that they're feathered <laughs> animals. Um, Sorry, but <laughs> but yeah, it's you know there, there isn't one. I mean, even in the living stuff, it's more or less convention from what people have used in general, rather than there being scientific terms for. Yeah, it's bored Victorians basically just yeah, na- naming pretty, stuff pretty much. Um, and so yes, we have prides of lions and herds of deer and flocks of sheep. Murder of crows. Murder of crows. Yeah, a parliament of owls, a crash of rhinoceros. There's... You know, there's all kinds of these things out there. But I mean, even even getting away from the, you know, obviously made up ones just to make a list, um, you know, like like flocks and, and herds. Well, they're used almost interchangeably for some groups as it is. So does it really matter? Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's like, you know, I, I could come up with a list, but I feel like I've got better things to do. I don't. So I might come up with a list. Uh- oh, I thought you were going to say, I don't you, you don't think I've got better things to do. <laughs> David, what about what about over raptors in terms of their intelligence versus like the 
Truodons because those they like they're smaller guys. They seem to be like like almost like more parrot like. Oh, like well, over over raptors or over raptorosaurs for the group are generally rather bigger. Are they bigger? I'm confusing them. Yeah, with them, I guess. Yeah, so so there's a, there's a couple of very little ones out there. So um, things like Cordipteryx are kind of not much more than knee high to us. Um, okay. But your your inverted commas average over raptorosaur from that group. They're they're, they're sizable. They'd be kind of head height to us. I mean, to that that ostrich like. Oh, well, there you it's go. A fairly small animal, but yeah, mo- perfect I mean, some for cars. Small- yeah, so some of the smallest the pterodontids are kind of you know big crow size or big mm. chicken size. So they're, they're, yeah. and that's the bigger ones. So they're they're really quite small in in the main. Um, I mean, the problem we've always got with intelligence is well, there's a bunch of problems we've got with estimating <laughs> intelligence. Um, the, the the standard thing is a thing called the EQ encephalization quotient, which is basically a ratio of body size to brain size. Because you need us as you get bigger, you do actually need more brain power just to run the mechanisms of the body. So even if you took two animals of identical intelligence but they had very different body sizes you'd expect the bigger animal to have a proportionally bigger brain so there's basically some metrics and and scaling effects to 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 sort it all out um but what you generally find is yeah once you make some allowances for body size you find things like humans right up top and then things like chimpanzees and dolphins and whales and some of the most intelligent birds and then other primates and then everything else and then stuff like frogs <laughs> <laughs> down the bottom and it more or less fits with what we'd think but of course measuring brain volume of dinosaurs is actually quite hard and measuring their body size is actually quite hard so you've got two pretty big problems instantly we, we, we only need two metrics okay we can't measure either of them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's apart your from first that we're good yeah, yeah. Um, and then the other big one which I've never seen discussed much and I have to be honest I don't know quite how far down this goes in birds um, but certainly the more advanced advanced birds I, I, I use words that I shouldn't use. Some of the um, later branching would be the correct term, but right. let's be blood. Some of the more in, some of the more intelligent birds, they have this weird kind of fo- form of, of of brain folding, and they're basically able to pack more nerve cells into a brain of a given volume than the mammals are. And this is part of the reason that they're rather smarter than you might imagine. Because although things like crows and parrots do have a pretty big brain for their size, they're outperforming well above of what you'd expect normally and this is why they, they basically packed a lot more brain in and of course the obvious question therefore is well what if dinosaurs or at least some dinosaurs are doing the same thing because then you measure the brain volume and you measure the size and go okay it fits roughly here on our vague intelligence scaling but what if it's got like twice the brain power for its size right oh then it's gonna jump up massively um but you oddly enough you can't tell <laughs> how, you know, individual cell packing is organized. Is there, is there any kind of... I'm sorry. No, I was going to ask if koalas have got very... They're the ones with the really smooth brain, aren't they? Cool. You don't know that. I, I, I've heard koalas' brains are nearly perfectly mm-hmm. smooth. They're really stupid. They basically... All they do is <laughs> eat, eat drugs all day and then sleep. And then they, when they yeah. need to, um, you know, procreate, they basically attack and drag females down from trees, have their wicked way with them, and then there are more koalas who are all high eating eucalyptus and sleeping all day. And that's all they can do, and they sort of brawl. What a great insult, you smooth brained idiot. That's, yeah. that's a great insult. <laughs> that's, that's pretty good, actually. Yeah. yeah. I was wondering, is there any evidence of, of any kind of tool like use through for, by dinosaurs? I mean, no. I know it's really, really hard to probably be able to tell something. And, and, that, and that's the classic problem. Yeah. Like, how, how would you, how would how you know? Would you see it? You'd have to because, find you know, in situ some kind of very specific thing. Yeah. You know, there, there's all kinds of tool use in chimpanzees sure. and gorillas and orangutans and stuff, but they're, they're, e- they're not... Sh- well, the, the stuff that they're shaping, so they will shape things like branches, but of course that's yeah. never going to preserve. And they will use rocks, and they're they're quite proficient in picking exact ones. Chimps, lots, lots of hammer and anvil, so they'll put something like a nut on one rock and then right. hit it with another rock, but they're just using the stuff that's around them. It's still tool use, but it's a rock hitting another rock. Well, we've got rocks everywhere in the fossil record. Yeah. That's not necessarily a fair indication that the dinosaurs are doing it. Thing. That was a fun um, bit growing up of the the, de- the definition of human behavior used to be like, oh, only humans use tools. Use tools. And then, of course, they start seeing examples. And it's like, oh, well, okay, not that so much anymore. So forget that part. But we do fire. Yeah. Fire is ours. We have fire. We like, that's us. That's for, that's us for sure. Yeah, that that one. Well, but then you've got Right, those, then you've got the crows um, that drop the fire the into hawks, things like yeah, that. Yeah. Or the hawks, yeah. So, so like, oh, yeah. okay, well, not so, so much. 
Yeah, there's there's, there's almost nothing that yeah. other animals don't do or don't have um, that that we do. I mean, yeah. th- obviously, a large part of that is this kind of a general human exceptionalism. But you know, at the same time, you know, we are unique, but so is everyone else. Right. You know, right. <laughs> to, to 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 paraphrase a life, right? You know, we're all individuals. Um, you know, it, we are special, but so is every other lineage. Right. There's this there's this wonderful thing called I think it's called the platypus fallacy, um, with the idea that if a, if a duckbill platypus gave a lecture about evolution, they'd go, you know, look at humans, look at how rubbish and primitive they are. They haven't evolved electro reception. They've still got their teeth. They haven't evolved venom. You know, they've got all these ridiculous features that they they you know they, they're stuck with these primitive five fingered hands, and they, these worthless teeth that we got with, and they can't sense the electromagnetic. So you, you know, rubbish. Haven't evolved properly at all. Um, and yeah, that. that that's pretty much it, which is why I admonished myself for saying, you know, advanced birds and things like this, because it it doesn't work like that, and we shouldn't think like that. Though it's really easy to do. Right. Well, yeah, yeah. One yeah. thing I'd like to sort of chip in on and chip because we're doing stoning anyway um, is the idea that um, you know people have a really weird idea about early human evolution. They sort of see it as the Stone Age, and they literally imagine that humans were doing everything with stone. And when I say humans, yeah. I don't just mean Homo sapiens; I mean all of them, mm. because those are things that survive that's why we call it the stone yeah. age and uh, as a result almost all of our ideas oh yeah you might have had a bit of animal skins but they had no weaving or anything no they did <laughs> you know, this is it's just what survives and what you know we imagine is a bit wrong a big thank you to george frabner um i didn't know half of the things about it. i'm still thinking about groups this is the thing i'm still thinking about hanging around and... <laughs> well that's because we've been stuck alone for a year well, so this start... is the thing. <laughs> oddly enough we think about living in groups a bit more but it, it, but it is that thing of you know a lot of people argue i mean particularly for human mental health is that we cannot survive very long. i mean there are a few human exceptions who deliberately go out and hermit and become hermits and that's the thing but we are incredibly social and it's not just in terms of survival it's in terms of um mental ability to just to perform everyday tasks without just sort of going i'll just give up now and drop dead yeah but i mean well that, that i mean that's you're heading towards you social species at that point which basically can't function outside of groups yeah well, i mean we're, we're not when you know we're nothing like being you social but we're as you say we're, we're definitely upper end of social living yeah on average apart from the weirdo <laughs> Mentioning no weird I was, yeah. was going to say that's, that's 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 probably offended half our listenership. <laughs> Only half. You you think a lot of us <laughs> dinosaur obsessed people? We're we're totally re- representative of the human species who listen to this podcast and make it. <laughs> I just want to say this, and in this episode, before we get near the um, end of the series, is that if you do have questions that you would like to ask Dave, please do um, write to us. Um, you can do that on our Patreon. So you go to patreon.com dot forward slash terror. Terrible lizards, or you can email terrible lizards pod at gmail.com. Um, we will, um, yeah, get we will try and you know do this for the questions episode at the end of the series. Um, only last time we did it a bit late and we had a lot of questions come in afterwards. So I want to make sure that throughout the series, people know that they can email us, can't they, Dave? Yes, yes. I love the way <laughs> you're so good at carrying on a conversation. But you're doing all the ending stuff, we haven't rehearsed it, so I didn't know. You only go, Dave, Dave. oh, right, I have to listen now, pay attention. What? Because what frustrates me is you get animals which just hang around together and they're not actually social at all. They're just going, oh, you look like me, I'll just stay here, which isn't social, is it? Yeah, well, again, so I'd call that gregariousness. If you are if you like hanging around in groups, but only because you just want other people about rather than you actually want to do anything with them, then, then that, I think, is probably what you'd call gregariousness. And that's what you see. So I, I think a, a good example of that is, you know, the, the idea that if you, you know, dump a whole load of random animals in a field they'll all hang around together you know if you put one goat one cow one sheep one pigeon one duck they'll, they'll all end up together and it, and I think that's a fundamental thing is that they're all herbivores they all watch out for predators they are all aware if obviously not consciously at some level that we're all looking out for the same thing 
and you know if i am eating hopefully someone else is looking and vice versa and on average will be safer i mean there's, there's a good amount of literature which shows that group size in a lot of species can be driven by predation risk the more predators there are and the more common they are the either groups that are individuals that normally live alone will start living in groups or group size will increase because obviously you just have that proportional vigilance increase for the group so that we know is an absolute major driver of it uh, and you get occasional um things like so in impala and vervet monkeys this is a really common one in south africa you get impala and vervet monkeys hanging around together because they tend to feed on not the same stuff but in on similar kind of trees so there's a reason to be together and both of them are really at risk from leopards so you're not in competition because you're not eating the exact same food so that's already a tick so you don't want to get rid of each other impala have really good hearing and uh vervet have much better eyesight so they're also trading off against each other's strengths and weaknesses but fundamentally they're both at risk and so yeah if you've got a group of 10 impala and 10 vervets that's now 19 people who are potentially looking when you've got your head in a bush and therefore the odds that that was entirely you and nothing to do with me and so the odds are you know that you're going to be much safer as a result of doing that and that appears to be driven predominantly by predation risk but it's not like they're social and that impala would choose to hang out with verbs or vice versa so yeah vigilance and predation are, are massive drivers of that and as i say that that goes back to that point i was making about well what do you mean by social because if you just mean hanging around in a group i think a lot of these wouldn't fit what most most behaviorist would call social biology. But you do get in certain groups, like I've seen documentaries where the uh, lions will be stalking a particular, like particularly juveniles mm. and other like wildebeest or water buffalo or whatever will come in and defend somebody else's offspring, which does suggest a group dynamic, not just a parental sort of gene theory, you know, selfish gene dynamic. Yeah. So the obvious question I have at that point for, for buffalo in particular is what is their breeding system because I don't know mm. it could be it could be females uh, mate with multiple males and therefore it could be yours uncertain parent it right mm. so that that, that was because that's that was my first thought is that if you don't if the baby might be so and again there's risk trade-offs as well you know the baby might be yours but if it's relatively low risk provided that there's 10 of you charging one lion then you've got potentially quite a lot to gain and you're not at very much risk at all. I suspect if it was one male buffalo who saw one baby being attacked, he'd be like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But there's also there's group behaviours which do imply um, so the corporation and there's also things like grooming. Yeah, I mean gro grooming is a very classic social driver of things. So is there any? Uh, there'll be obviously there can't be really any evidence that this would happen with dinosaurs at all. No, because th this is the problem. I mean, e even if two of them died mid groom, the odds that they'd be preserved like that because mm -hmm. even you know even if it was you know we get things like carbon monoxide poisoning, we think is killing some of them in some of the volcanoes stuff you know odorless tasteless colorless you're dead before you even know that you've breathed it in and you die in in seconds you you could almost you know almost like vesuvius you could almost literally be frozen in that point in time and then died and buried but would we still be able to say that confidently i mean you know here's two head to tail and their heads are laying over each other's tails well yeah that's the kind of mutual grooming posture that birds do but again they could also have just been sitting like that when they died maybe they were fighting and they were trying to turn around and each was trying to bite the other you you don't know um and you probably almost certainly probably almost certainly, you almost certainly couldn't interpret it or with at least interpret it with any degree of confidence Aww. yeah i know it's pain isn't it yeah, it's <laughs> maybe annoying dave and with that on that bombshell on that really frustrating we will never know well but i mean what one thing i would say is you know is data is always improving we have more and more specimens being found with more and more groups and better trackways we have a better understanding of how we should interpret this stuff it, it is going to improve our understanding what we need is to find a dinosaur holding a pair of scissors while another dinosaur looks in a mirror yes
and then we will know that hairdressers have always existed. With, 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 with some kind of bad pun about <laughs> written on the wall above it. I'm trying to think of dinosaur hairdresser puns. Well, no, I'm trying to. We'll be back next week with, <laughs> with the answer But you, to the you know, you know a, a cut above the rest. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or haircuts but... spelt with a Z or a Z. <laughs> A Z. Oh, come on. We've got some standards. All right, then. Um, until um, next week. Chop, chop. Rawr, rawr. Thank you for listening to the Terrible Lizards podcast, especially if you're a patron. Without you, we wouldn't have made this series. To be the first to hear bonus episodes and get extended interviews, please consider donating at patreon.com forward slash Terrible Lizards. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook and YouTube so you don't miss out on live broadcasts. All the links are available in the show notes or go to terriblelizards.co.uk. If you can't afford to support us financially, please do share this episode with your friends and leave us a review on your podcast app. Do say hello via social media or drop us an email, terriblelizardspod at gmail.com. We love hearing from you and we love to answer your dinosaur questions. 